I'm Philip Brokham, and this is an introduction to conditional probability. We're going to start with an example involving O.J. Simpson. During his trial, his defense lawyer used a statistic similar to the following. 99% of the time, men who beat their wives don't end up killing them. Therefore, even if O.J. Simpson beat his wife, it's almost certain that he didn't kill her. Now, even if that statistic is true, the conclusion is false, because an important statistic was left out. Here is a slightly less misleading statement. 99% of the time, men who beat their wives don't end up killing them. However, of the wives who are beaten and later killed, 90% of them are killed by their husbands. Do you see the difference? Of course most people don't kill their wives. But, in the small percent of cases where the wife is killed, it's almost always the husband who did it. Let's try another one. In this example, I'm going to use drunk drivers. 99% of the time, you won't get into an accident when you drive drunk. Therefore, driving drunk is safe. False. Again, here's a slightly less misleading statement. 99% of the time, you won't get into an accident when you drive drunk. However, 90% of all auto accidents involve alcohol. Do you see the difference now? Conditional probability is all about narrowing down the set of possible circumstances so that the statistics can be measured more accurately. Sure, 99% of the time, beaten wives aren't killed. But O.J. Simpson's wife was killed. We are no longer talking about the 99% of cases where the wife lives because she didn't live. We are already in the unlikely 1% case where the wife is killed. Any statistics relating to the other 99% of cases don't apply anymore. This is conditional probability, with the condition being that the wife was, in fact, killed. In my next example, I'm going to focus on coin tossing. Here's the coin I toss with my left hand. Here's the coin I toss with my right hand. So I'm tossing two coins. And here are the possible outcomes. The left hand coin could be heads up, and the right hand coin could also be heads up. Or the left hand coin could be heads up, and the right hand coin could be tails up. Or I could get tails and heads, or two tails. There are four possible outcomes. Here is the question. What is the probability that I get two heads. If you've done probability before, this is going to be really easy. There are four ways I could flip two coins, and in one of those ways, I get two heads. Therefore, the probability is one out of four, or one-fourth. Let's try a hard one. Given that one coin is heads, what is the probability that the other coin is also heads? It is not one-half. You have to be careful here. The condition that one coin is heads rules out the possibility of getting two tails. Of the remaining three ways the coins could be flipped, only one results in both coins being heads. Therefore, the probability is one-third. It makes sense if you think about it. The probability of getting two heads is one-fourth. If you know that you already have one head, surely the probability must go up a little bit, right? You are already halfway there, after all. In this case, it increases to one-third. Let me see if I can really confuse you. Given that the left-hand coin is heads up, what's the probability that the other coin is also heads up? Be careful, this is not the same question. In this case, two of the four possible outcomes are eliminated. Of the two remaining possible outcomes, one of them results in both coins being heads, for a probability of one-half. Let me do a quick summary. Starting from a blank slate with no extra information, the probability of getting two heads is one-fourth. If we have more information, if we can guarantee the condition that at least one coin is heads, that increases our odds to one-third. With even more information, the knowledge of which coin is heads, we increase our odds up to one-half. 
using conditions to narrow down the number of possible outcomes, we can get more accurate statistics for a given circumstance. I'm now going to walk you through a very famous conditional probability problem. It's also more mathy. We are going to test for HIV. Here are some statistics that I just made up. One out of every thousand people has HIV. The test for HIV is 99% accurate. This means if you don't have HIV, 1% of the time the test will be falsely positive. And if you do have HIV, 1% of the time the test will be falsely negative. Here is the question. You test positive for HIV. What is the probability that you actually have HIV? It is not 99%. Even if, or even though, the test is 99% accurate, and even though you test positive for it, you do not have a 99% chance of having HIV. Let's walk through it. Pretend that there are 100,000 people in the world. That means there are 100 people with HIV and 99,900 people without it. Of the 100 people with HIV, 99 test positive and 1 tests falsely negative. Of the 99,900 people who don't have HIV, 1% of them test falsely positive as well which is 999 people. That is a lot of people. The other 98,901 people correctly test negative. Let's add these numbers up. 100 people have HIV. Why? Because one out of every thousand people has it, and there's 100,000 people. 99 of those people test positive. Why? Because the test is only 99% accurate. 1% of the time, it screws up. 99,900 people don't have HIV. That's 100 less than 100,000, right? Um, 999 of them still test positive. Why? Again, because the test screws up 1% of the time, and 1% 1 of 99,900 is still 999 people, right? So it's a large number. These are the only two numbers you should be worrying about. A quick recap. 99 people test positive because they have HIV. 999 people test positive because the test screwed up. Add those up and we get 1,098 people uh, in total test positive for HIV. Let's quickly review our question. You test positive for HIV. What is the probability that you actually have HIV. This is conditional probability. Don't worry about the fact that there are 100,000 people out there. And don't worry about the fact that the test is 99% accurate. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that you belong to this small group of 1,098 people who tested positive. Nothing else matters because you don't belong to the other group. You belong to this group. You are one of these 1,098 people. Now the question's really easy. Of those 1,098 people, 99 have HIV. It turns into a simple division problem. 99 out of 1,098 is 9.0164%. So your chance of having HIV is 9.0164%. Even with a test that is 99% accurate, testing positive for HIV gives you a less than 1 in 10 chance of actually having the disease. Pretty cool, huh? So what the hell is going on? The key is that although the test is 99% accurate, it's actually far more likely that the test is wrong than for you to actually be HIV positive. HIV affects one in a thousand people in my example. The chance of error in the test is 1%. But the chance of having the disease is 0.1%. It's 10 times more likely that the test is just wrong.
I'm going to end the slides here and just say a few words about probability. It's hard, and conditional probability is really hard. Here's my advice if you're just getting into it. Don't think about it. I know you thought you'd never hear me say that, but trust me, if you try to think about it, you're gonna get it wrong. Probability is very counterintuitive. When you're just starting out, the only surefire way to get it right is to list out all the possibilities and count them. Or if you can't count them, write out the numbers and add them up, just like I did with the HIV example. It's the only way to make sure, and the only way to keep yourself from getting confused. Anyway, probability is my favorite field of math. I love it. I think it's awesome, precisely because it's so hard to understand. So I wish you luck. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you now have a at least decent understanding of what conditional probability is.